So I'm going to begin by telling you that you are all wrong. <laughs> but so am I. Um, it's a question as to what we're wrong on. This is a picture a few years ago of Bernard, Bernard Escudier surfing uh, off Malibu Beach uh, in California. He tells me you can't get up on the board anymore. I would believe that if I saw it. I'm going to talk mainly about a phase one, two study that we've run where we have phase one data and then some other things that we're doing. Um, and uh, this is brought to you uh, for Tanya Dorf, who couldn't be here today because of the Jewish holiday. Uh, she's at home cooking for 20 people, being a good Jewish housewife, and also um, in concert with Walter Longo, who we now are nearing a decade's uh, work together. I, I saw this the other day in the American Cancer Society uh, review, which I was interested in. And I'm going to talk to you mainly about what happens inside the cells and to the patients. But there's a whole other spectrum or spectra of what we, we do with this. And it relates with uh, very closely on how the patients arrive at our doorstep as oncologists. So the obese um, patient who has a BMI incidentally greater than mine, uh, 29.6 this morning calculated at the hotel. Uh, so borderline uh, obese. Uh, but so if they're bigger than me, they're fat. If they're smaller than me, they're not. Um, but the patients that arrive that are, that are sedentary, that are obese and have metabolic syndrome before we start, uh, have particular issues. And we know from a large set of historical data from the LA Cancer uh, uh, Registry that we run out of USC, that these patients historically have done a lot worse with cancer, almost no matter what it is, uh, with a couple of notable uh, exceptions that we can talk about if you like. So, this is the study. This is Tanya Dorf. The first thing you'll observe is that her BMI is not 29.6. Uh, it's actually closer. I think it's, it's he admits to 21.2, um, and that's probably with clothes on. Don't go there. She's also, also better looking than me, uh, something that Bernard has observed multiple times, uh, including when he met her, I think, at, at ESMO, at her poster. This is Volta Longo's uh, slide, and I think it's really important because I said to Volta, I don't care what you're showing me, you've got to show me that if we can help normal cells, why don't we give them chemotherapy or radiation or whatever else it is, I want to know what we're doing to the, uh, to the normal cells, or no, that we're not actually helping the tumour cells. So uh, he then put together uh, some data that, that proved that, at least to me at the time. And I think the basic thing is that tumour cells, whether you believe it's a metabolic disease or a genetic disease, I'm not getting into it, uh, it's probably both, uh, but the genetic mess-ups that occur in cells probably make them susceptible to metabolic manipulation. So that was Volta's premise, and he said not only that, the fact that normal cells are normal and have normal genes means they can actually respond to uh, deprivation, whether it's uh, a short-term fast uh, or something equivalent, and will switch on stuff with these genes that will protect them. So that's the overall premise, very simple. Um, and if that proves to be right, then I, I think that that will change the way we do uh, cancer treatment. Uh, and that's what I told Bernard. I didn't give him any data. Today, I will give him some data. These are some data not from me, but from Walter's lab, uh, from uh, Lisa uh, Rag Ragapello, um, looking at different chemotherapy treatments and showing particular things that I think are actually important uh, in different uh, brands of myosin with different chemotherapy. In almost, but not every one, they demonstrated that, uh, that the, um, the cancer cells were more sensitive to chemotherapy in the fasted or deprived state, and that normal cells uh, were actually not. Uh, and also, in addition, uh, that the mice that fasted had a better survival overall and maintained their weight better uh, than those who did not. So there did appear to be a protective effect on the organism um, and potentially a, uh, an effect of uh, potentiating the effect of chemotherapy in the cancer cells, which was what we wanted to see. So we went and asked some patients, and Walter had a collection of people uh, logging into his uh, Rockstar website, emailing him at all hours of the day, both in Genoa and also Los Angeles, and we said, we're going to survey these people. So we talked to the patients. Uh, and we asked them about their toxicities because, as Walter showed this slide before, we wanted to get an idea of what the difference might be because we had no data to go on. And these demonstrated and now published several years ago uh, that there did appear to be a reduction in certain toxicities, but not in others. 
Patients ask, incidentally, about whether if they fast, they will have less hair loss. The bad news is probably that's not a difference. Uh, but there are other toxicities, particularly uh, fatigue and gastrointestinal toxicities, that we think are improved. But it's a matter of how we'd prove that. So we designed a study, and we wanted to uh, test safety of fasting over a period of time. And I'll show you that iteration in a minute. But by concept, this is the schema. So in the first cycle, or the first cycle they engage in the study, they're fasting for a period of time, what turned out to be 48 hours, up until chemotherapy. Then they got chemo, we asked them to fast for another 24 hours after that, and they were then to eat normally for the rest of the cycle, whether it be two or three weeks. They then did another cycle uh, of the same. <clears throat> we drew samples for biomarkers at each of the time points that you can see there, and I'll show you a little bit of that data, even though it comes from the phase one study, and we haven't looked at the phase two yet. So this is the schema, which for people that don't do phase one studies, um, it's, uh, it's, it's like learning about cricket. They say, um, it, people from America, they say, can you teach me about cricket? And we say to them rather rudely, something would be understood in France, do you have pubic hair? And they say, well, sure, I got pubic hair. They say, well, in that case, you, you're, you're now too old to learn about cricket. So you need to learn when you're young. For phase one studies, it's similar. So if you, and the, the people from England actually understand that joke, sorry. Um, so if for phase one studies, if you haven't learned about it by the time you finish your oncology fellowship, you probably shouldn't start. But what we do is we use a, a principle of mathematics to try and test that something's safe. So for scientific rigour, we wanted to make sure that a 24-hour fast was safe and also feasible, but the safety was the main parameter. We then wanted to go on to 48 hours, as you can see down here, working down our schematic, to see if it was safe. And we then wanted to look at 48 plus 24 because we thought that was what was needed for a fast to, to make a difference based on, on some data that we had. As we went through it, uh, we got to this point, and the bright orange is where we got. In actual fact, we could show safety at every point. We could not show feasibility. Not every patient could fast. Some of them lied about it. Most of them didn't. I came in and I had the Sunday, fa a Sunday uh, festival lunch with my family before chemotherapy on Monday. I'm really sorry. Uh, so those patients were documented as non-compliant. Some other, we other patients where things didn't add up, we also said, did you actually stick to your diet? Well, no. So we showed safety, uh, but feasibility was a, a question, and that led us to other, other places. What were the toxicities of fasting? Because patients ask you. Well, we did see some low blood glucose, but at a very minor level. We did see some low sodium at a very minor level. Uh, but the rest of the things were symptomatic. And patients that are fasting, particularly beyond 48 hours, will complain of a low-grade headache, dizziness, and fatigue quite commonly. Most of them think it's tolerable. And on the grades in which we measure cancer toxicity, these things are minor. They also got chemotherapy, which we were interested in. Uh, and you can see here, uh, there are too few numbers to make any conclusions, uh, except that this toxicity did not appear to get worse uh, in patients that fasted for a longer time. So they didn't get weaker and have more trouble getting through the chemotherapy. We looked at some markers. Uh, we looked at, at IGF-1 and uh, also ketone markers, and we did see some changes where they fell. If we put the patients in that were non-compliant, either by their own uh, admission or on further interrogation, we did not get a consistent pattern, but generally we did see IGF-1 fall. Uh, there are other measures with, with, um, with binding proteins going up, and also the development of an elevation of, uh, of ketones, as you can see here, certainly by 24 hours. Interestingly, did not seem to be maintained in all patients. We, we don't know why, it was a question that, that we had, and the question was, was really the fast being maintained at an adequate level? This is a, the summary of our biomarkers. This is in a very, very small set of patients, but uh, if you look across here at the p-values, which we like to be 0.05 in our studies that are adequately powered, uh, there is a trend towards the biomarkers uh, favoring a change in time, and we'll be testing this more uh, when we move into the phase two component of the study. Can we look at damage to tissues in another way? Well, these are olive moments. An olive moment is where a lymphocyte gets blurred and basically fragmented. And you can see up here in the schematic, it develops a tail. It's like a comet. 
Um, and so uh, that's indicative of damage to a normal cell. We were able to look at these uh, in the patients that went on. It's a consistent assay done in, uh, in Volta's laboratory uh, in Los Angeles. And what we found was that we're, there was a reduction in these uh, olive uh, moments and these olive tails uh, that occurred uh, relative to going from the 24 hour to the uh, 48 and 72 hour fast. The p-value just not quite significant but suggestive of a trend uh, as you can see there. Lymphocytes recovered better in patients that fasted. And so as you can see here in, in the patients where we have data, this effect was uh, noted more the longer the patients fasted. This is a, a relative marker of, of how we did. We went back and looked at this for a subsequent paper because we were looking at the questions of uh, some stem cell effects and that subsequently been published. So what did we get out of this? We successfully translated some of the work from Walter Longo's lab into the clinic. We demonstrated that uh, fasting for 72 hours with a 48 plus uh, 24 uh, hour premise was safe and feasible in a proportion of patients, but the compliance was a challenge. So how did we take this data? Well, we were interested that we were able to complete the study, but Walter had to go on antidepressants. He said, I'm going back to the mice, dealing with humans, make him follow the diet fast is a real problem. I don't want to deal with this. So he said, okay, we'll, we'll work on that. And, and I've said, I will continue doing the study in the phase two because I think fasting is important. We also showed some surrogate markers and at some stage I hope to show you the phase uh, two where we may do an interim of some patients. We then asked some more questions about what it would be worth for patients to fast or go in a, in a, in a, a dietary study. And they were more interested in going in a dietary modification study than doing <laughs> fasting. And in addition, the amount they thought they'd get out of it was, uh, was similar in that assessment. And we had some data to show that we could uh, develop the chemo leave diet, uh, which uh, Volta worked on with some collaborators uh, to mimic fasting. And he can talk some more, more to you about that uh, outside. We did randomize studies. Uh, and so from that perspective, um, with uh, docetaxel based therapy in both breast and prostate cancer, and you'll be interested to know that we're almost finished the breast study. But of course the men, difficult to randomise and who do not understand equipoise, even when it translated into French, are much more difficult to randomise. Also we're giving less docetaxel chemotherapy, so we're working on that. And then future directions I think are with the, uh, the mimic diets. We need to look at the immune system, which I think is important. And patients getting hormonal therapy for prostate cancer, a particular group that we're interested in, uh, and we've just completed a study uh, of exercise and whey protein diet uh, uh, that we're analysing at the moment in that group. And Avalta has published looking at, uh, in systems, the immune system. And I'd better get off or I'll be dragged off by Bernard, but just to make the point, a lot of collaborators listed here, Tanya Dorf sends her apologies, and we add to our support at the bottom, uh, Air France, uh, Acor Hotels, Gustav Risi, Bernard and JJ, thank you very much, and I'll be interested in discussion. <laughs> <laughs>